Ward, I want to talk to you. First, we had two things happen this week. We have the new Congress. We have Boehner uh, taking his role. But we also had some changes at the White House. They're, they they were not at, uh, silent this week. So put the week in perspective for us. I mean, who won this first week of 2011? Well, I think it's a tie. <clears throat> I think the Republicans uh, came in with a lot of fanfare. They, uh, they elected their new speaker. Um, he was smart in that he was brief. I was uh, I was shocked at how long Nancy Pelosi went on for. She spoke just uh, sh thirty words less than than Boehner, even though it was his day. Yeah, Boehner. right. Exactly. I mean, it's 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 one of those things. I I think uh, you know Boehner acquitted himself well. Uh, he only cried twice that I counted on uh, on Wednesday during his in inaugural or whatever we call that installation. Um, but I think the Republicans did run into a little bit of a buzzsaw over uh, the, the the rules and the issue of openness. But you know, I'm thinking back. Uh, Every new party who takes over the House and from 94 to the Democrats back to the Republicans, they all promised openness, and, and it, it never it never appeared. Right. So it's almost I don't think the, any Democrat is surprised by that. <laughs> it's almost one of the rituals they have to go right. through. Is that right. Both parties were sort of changing arguments. Rob, I want to get your sense of uh, what you thought Boehner, he, uh, as Ward mentioned, it was a short speech. Mm -hmm. Newt Gingrich went on for 6,000 words, Boehner just 1,300. Uh, what did you get? If he's kicking off the tone for this new Congress, what did you hear from him? I think the tone that he's really uh, kicking out is the austerity idea. And you look, go back to Newt Gingrich and remember the contract with America, this huge fanfare on the, on the Capitol steps and all these people standing out there. And, and Boehner was, it was very muted. And I think that's what they wanted to do. He's not the center of attention. You talk about Nancy Pelosi trying, you know, being kicking, dragging, and screaming, holding on to the, to the gavel. That's not what the Republicans want to do. That's not what Boehner wants to do. He is taking charge as the Republicans and giving it, as he said, the people's house. Letting it, it's really going to be a muted leadership. He's not going to be the focus. It was amazing when he started. His first big image and analogy was to Ash Wednesday, the Catholic tradition yeah. where they say you are come from dust and to dust you will return. That's not exactly lifting rhetoric about a, a new way. <laughs> it's a kind of it's 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 very austere. Yeah. Um, uh, let's it may be it may be apropos to a zero sum gain kind of politics that we're, that this town is going to see. I think in the next two years, where Republicans will put forward all these ideas, starting right away with this ridiculous health care repeal measure that they know will go nowhere. And I think that's what's going to happen for mm -hmm. the next two. Are years. Democrats going to find their voice now that they're in the minority? I mean, you heard Congressman Welch. You know, uh, it does give them. They can. He, his argument is they can focus on the good stuff now in this new position they're in. When they were trying to build the health care bill, everything got. You know, Republicans were successful in finding the bad stuff and and talking about right. it. Well, now that Democrats are in the minority, are they going to find their voice either on health care or or just in general? Well, the interesting point is who would that be? I don't know that Nancy Pelosi can really speak for the party going forward, and I don't think that Harry Reid is an effective speaker. So the real issue is can Barack Obama find his voice and speak for his own program? You know, and, and uh, the congressman was making the point about how people like all the individual components of the health care but not the overall health care bill. Why is it coming down to that now? I mean, why why wasn't that better explained to the American people? It seems to me the Democrats have really done a very, very bad job because when you do get into the specifics, you know, nobody's going to say, oh, yeah, I don't want to put my kid on my health care insurance uh, up until he's 26. Rob, the president uh, has a new approach to this mm -hmm. new w world, and he got some new help this week. He named uh, Bill Daley will be his mm -hmm. chief of staff and also a spokesman, while David Axelrod goes to Chicago. Robert mm -hmm. Gibbs decided he's leaving this week to do go. So there's a lot of shifts at the White House. What does it all mean? Well, you know, we talked about earlier uh, during for Christmas, the lame duck session was Obama 2.0. I think what you're seeing right now is White House 2.0. They've gone from the battles with the within their own party on Capitol Hill to pass health care, to pass financial reform, and now they're looking at 2012, and they're looking at rebuilding the economy. They realize that they need a good economy to win re-election in two years. And so you have Bill Daley, who is a very good spokesperson, who has extremely strong ties to the business community, formerly with J.P. Morgan, has was on the board of Boeing and some of these companies. And with the new person, with Gibbs gone, they'll have a soon-to-be-named person at the podium in the White House briefing room. So they're really going to go and try to sell their policies to the American people, to the small business owner themselves. They really try to think take the fight beyond Washington. And I think that's what you're going to see starting with this new team. One of the things that was striking about picking Daly is that in December of 2009, he wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post and said, basically, the left of the Democratic Party has to realize that the landscape has changed and you're not going to get what you want, which sort of matched up with the message the president was sending during the lame duck Congress when he made that deal with Republicans. 
So there's a shift going here, as Rob, uh, going on here, as Rob mentioned. But you've watched White Houses before. Do these shifts happen as neatly as White Houses would like? You change some people, you put a new message out there, and everything's fine. Well, you know, I was thinking, you know, one of the most famous White House uh, switches was uh, Jim Baker and uh, Don Definitely. Regan, and that happened because Don Regan couldn't get along with the First Lady. And then you go to Clinton, he seemed to have a raft of chiefs of staff. Uh, and, you know, really the bottom line is the chief of staff can only be as good as the president lets him be. I mean, let's face it, it's Barack Obama who drives this. It's not, it's not going to be just the chief of staff. It's not going to just be the press secretary. If the president can't set his priorities and keep them straight, there's no way the chief of staff or, or the press secretary can do that. It's got to come from the top. Now, the thing I like about Daly is that he's like he's a Rahm Emanuel fighter without the missing finger. I mean, he knows how to he knows how to talk to people. And uh, you know, I, I I remember I was on the receiving end of a phone call in the 2000 election when he said, "Hey, you know what? This isn't over." We're unconceding. That right, was this his is when word. he worked for Al Gore. That's right. He was, he was Al Gore's campaign uh, chairman, and you know, and then went went about his business. And I don't think he has the need to be as public and as and as uh, widely seen as Rahm Emanuel does. Uh, he's not uh, from that liberal wing of the party. You know, Rahm was schooled under Nancy Pelosi in a lot of ways. So um, you know, and I think. All you need to know is uh, the Chamber of Commerce loves Bill Daley, right. and that's a, that that's got to be a win for Barack Obama. Chamber of Commerce loves him, unions not so much. Um, final question to both of you, and I'll start with you, Rob. Which is the, the next thing we're all looking forward to is the State of the Union, mm -hmm. which is a tricky thing because it turns out sometimes it's a laundry list. On the other hand, as we've been discussing, the president is in the middle of trying to reposition himself here. So uh, the f question uh, is, Rob, um, what's he going to say? What what's the message people are going to leave that State of the Union with when it comes? I think what the President's going to do in the State of the Union is really lay out the priorities of the country in terms of spending and budget. He really has the opportunity to get in front of the Republicans on the cutting and reducing the debt issue. And he's going to go up and say, and he, he started to do this a little bit at the end of last year, oh, we need an education system, we need to be competitive, are we willing to sacrifice American education system because we want to save some money in the budget? Are we willing to sacrifice innovation, research and development? He's really going to try to say what should our values be and what should we spend on those values? And to try to get ahead of this issue of when the Republicans are saying let's just cut X number of dollars from the budget. I think you see with Sperling coming in, you see with Jack Luke, uh, Jack Luke coming in, they're going to really focus on cutting the budget, but they're going to cut it their way and the White House is going to get in front of what spending means to the average person. It's a good point about Jack Lew and Sperling and Daley. They all veterans of the Clinton administration. The last time a Democratic president had to fight with a Republican Congress to cut the budget, get things in line. Um, so, is it going to work? Well, <clears throat> we'll see. Uh, I think they have to. You know, one 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 problem is the message because it's hard to say America's best days are ahead of us while you're cutting everything back. That seems to be counterintuitive. Um, the other thing that I had heard was that they were going to dust off the old Bowles, uh, uh, oh, the Simpson, Bowles Simpson plan, right. plan and, and get down to business uh, that way uh, and, and make some of those tough choices. And no doubt there's going to be tough choices. So Well, well that's the thing. It's going to be like math homework every morning for the American people. Mm -hmm. I mean, all anybody's talking about it. Boehner said the same thing in his uh, investiture remarks. Um, you know, hard choices, sacrifice, pain. Barack Obama is going to be trying to get reelected, and and in theory, his only message is going to be pain, cutting, unpleasantness. That doesn't seem like a great way to. No, it doesn't. But I think his best friend going forward uh, in in getting reelected will be the Republican field. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, he'll 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 be dealt a, a hand that looks pretty much like the hand Bill Clinton was dealt, which is they don't have a lot of very strong candidates out there. And, and I might say, you know, it's early in the game, but if I, you know, if I'm Barack Obama, I'm feeling pretty good. Well, and proof of that is the fact that this week we had rumors about Rudy Giuliani maybe getting in uh, after a disastrous race in 2008, and even Michelle Bachman, Michelle Bachman. the congresswoman. So it, it apparently, if you're a Republican, you want to run for president. Thank you both very much for being with us. And thanks all of you for being with us. Please watch Washington Unplugged each day at 1230 right here on CBSNews.com. I'm John Dickerson. Have a great weekend.